Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Student-Centered Learning. I'm Sunny Day, a Program Director with the National Conference of State Legislatures Education Program, where I oversee our work on personalized, competency-based, student-centered learning. It's our pleasure to welcome more than 30 participants from 18 states to the webinar today. Thanks for joining us. This webinar is the fifth in a series sponsored by the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission, a bipartisan group of state legislators and legislative staff studying legislative policy options, obstacles, and recommendations to help states move forward with systems that support student-centered learning opportunities. Student-centered learning generally means that learning is personalized, Learning is competency-based, learning takes place anytime, anywhere, and students have ownership over their learning. Our webinars to date have included an overview of competency-based education, a look at elements of state ESSA plans that are student-centered, an overview of performance-based assessments, and a look at support for teachers and leaders in student-centered learning environments. If you missed those webinars, the archived videos and PowerPoints are available on the NCSL website. The Commission would like to thank the Nellie May Education Foundation for sponsoring our work and this webinar series. Today we are lucky to hear from three experts on student-centered learning who will explore how personalized, Competency-based education can advance learning for English language learners, for students with disabilities, and for struggling students, and how policymakers can build equity and inclusion into design, planning, and implementation of student-centered learning. Before we get started, I'd like to define student-centered learning, which generally exists in schools and districts that have intentionally developed educational programs, learning experiences, instructional approaches, and academic support strategies that are intended to address the distinct learning needs, interests, and aspirations of individual students. The NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission visited six such learning environments in 2018, and every school approached these goals differently. But throughout each one, we saw and talked with students who were excited, knowledgeable, and had some control over their short and long-term learning goals. Students were actively participating in decisions about their learning. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our webinar speakers. Rebecca Wolf is Vice President of Impact and Improvement for KnowledgeWorks, overseeing the research, impact, and improvement efforts that reinforce KnowledgeWorks program and policy initiatives and advance the field of personalized, competency-based learning. Rebecca is responsible for the organization's research agenda, which focuses on impact and improvement of the work we, they do in schools, districts, and communities, as well as research projects that help to advance the field. Prior to joining KnowledgeWorks, Rebecca served as an Associate Vice President at Jobs for the Future, where she directed the Students at the Center initiative. Ace Parsi is the Director of Innovation at the National Center for Learning Disabilities, where he works to ensure students with disabilities fully benefit from initiatives aiming to personalize learning for all students. He previously served as the Deeper Learning Project Director at the National Association of State Boards of Education, where he worked with state boards of education nationally on a variety of topics, including assessments, accountability, high school graduation requirements, educator capacity, and other issues related to ensuring students have the knowledge, skills, and dispositions essential for college, career, and civic success. And finally, Natalie Trong is a policy director at iNicole. Prior to joining iNicole, Natalie was a policy analyst in the education division of the National Governors Association's Center for Best Practices. And Natalie began her career as an English teacher in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. With that, Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you 
to talk about how student-centered learning has evolved over the years and some of the common misperceptions about the students who benefit from student-centered learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, having joined KnowledgeWorks just under a month ago, a lot of the work that I'm going to speak about today is research and work that I did as part of Jobs for the Future. And you'll see both JFF and KnowledgeWorks on most of the slides as we are currently uh, working together to share some of the research work and transition it over to KnowledgeWorks. So we have uh, been focused through students at the Center and KnowledgeWorks on building the evidence and research base for student-centered approaches for uh, almost nine years now with a particular focus on the approaches that um, work best and in which context for uh, learners who have been uh, traditionally marginalized by um, many of the current uh, systems in our country. So um, first, at KnowledgeWorks, where I am now, we believe that all children can learn and should be challenged as individuals. And we know that the world of work and learning is changing at a very rapid pace. And as I'm sure many of you on the call are very aware of, we also that means we need to think differently about college and career readiness. So we focus at KnowledgeWorks on making sure that every student masters their academic content, but also encourage them to take ownership of their learning and help them to develop the social emotional skills they need for whatever comes next. And that's really at the heart of what we do in schools, in policy, in advocacy, research, and in local contexts. So nine years ago, with the support of Nellie May, oh, Sorry, I didn't realize the slide was animated. How exciting. Um, just getting it all up there for you. So we developed this framework of what it meant when we said student-centered learning. And you heard Sunny um, describe some of those uh, elements uh, at the beginning of the call. But for us, for something to be student-centered learning, it needs to have four elements. It needs to be personalized. It needs to have some kind of element of student ownership, student voice. It needs to take place anytime, anywhere, and harness um, what we know about uh, when the brain works and when the brain um, is available for learning, which isn't necessarily at 8 in the morning or doesn't necessarily turn off at 2 in the afternoon. So really taking advantage of all there is out there in the learning uh, environments and then competency-based. So um, being able to um, measure learning more authentically and um, more connected to when the student is actually learning it. And my uh, colleagues in the next couple of um, presentations will speak a little bit more about some of these elements. But um, we spent uh, the first year and a half or so of students at the center pulling together all available research that we could on different elements of um, what went into how students learn, what motivates them, what they need to know, and in particular, where student-centered learning works for which students and in what context. So what's really important to understand about this endeavor is that not only did we start out um, really with sort of myth-busting right away, this idea that student-centered learning can only be done in well-resourced, middle-class white schools and districts. But in fact, the whole reason that we embarked on this was because of work that we were doing on the ground and with schools and with state leaders um, in two different settings. One is the College Career and Technology Academy in um, in Texas, and it's way down in the border uh, with Mexico, and um, quite low income population, very high bilingual, um, a lot of mobility back and forth across the border. And um, at the College and Career Technology Academy, they created it because they were seeing the high rate of dropouts in that area, um, losing a high number of kids, and the school district didn't want to do that um, and continue to ignore that issue. So instead of putting them in front of a computer and doing credit recovery and hoping for the best, they created an entirely different academy structure that not only recovery dropouts, but immediately connected them to post-secondary learning, career pathways work, um, and help them start earning college credits 
And one of the key differences in this work was that it was really tailored to each student's needs. So rather than having to repeat an entire math class, they were able to take very targeted um, coursework to fill in the gaps in their knowledge rather than forcing them to sit through the courses that didn't work for them the first time. And likewise, we've worked for years with Boston Day and Evening Academy over in Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm based. And this is a school that has been functioning for almost 20 years now, uh, focused on recovering students who have dropped out of the Boston public schools or are on their way to being pushed out of the system. And from its very beginning, it was a competency-based and is a competency-based school because they recognized, again, that you can't well serve students who have had such a disruption in their schooling uh, and are trying to get themselves back on track if you um, then force them to sit in the same kind of classroom that failed them to begin with. So these were really at the heart of the models that started um, our investigations nine years ago into what does the research say about this kind of work. Similarly, in New England, uh, where we work, this is a map showing where we know districts and schools uh, have really taken great uh, strides towards being more student-centered. And this is, um, we track this with the help of the Nellie May Education Foundation, so that's why our data is mostly in New England. And I know it's a little hard to see on these slides, but if you look for the dark shadows of those um, blue location markers, that's where there are multiple sites and high concentration of um, places that we are seeing student-centered learning. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, given this is a uh, myth-busting that this only happens in well-resourced, well-to-do, largely white districts, those places of high concentration are Burlington and Montpelier in Vermont, Portland in Maine, Boston in Massachusetts, Providence, Rhode Island, and Hartford and New Haven in Connecticut. So we are seeing a lot of these models emerging in um, areas that you would not tend to think of as um, immediately as well-resourced. So not satisfied with just um, mapping this, our research looks specifically at the idea that certain kids might not learn well in less structured settings or, or that some kids, those kids, need to get basics down first. And I, I hope in my tone you're hearing the quotation marks up around certain kids and those kids because as we know that um, tends to be unfortunately some thinly veiled racism around who can learn and where they can learn. And so we wanted to get to the heart of that matter. So we co uh, commissioned research papers that looked at specific content areas and specific populations. Um, the cover you see on the left is literacy practices for African-American male adolescents. And it asks the question of um, how are our African-American males in this country learning literacy? And what it found was that most of the current dominant literacy practices have failed our African-American males. And we can see this in NAEP scores and the very little um, achievement in closing gaps that we have made over all the years of No Child Left Behind's focus on it. Um, whereas if we look at the research on student-centered approaches, including techniques that have um, as part of them engagement, resiliency building, and rich and deep content um, and text reading, uh, these student-centered practices are far more conceptually sound in what we know advances literacy of African-American males. The second study, um, Curricular Opportunities in the Digital Age, um, asked the question of given the proliferation of uh, digital technology in our classrooms, are we disadvantaging uh, students with learning differences? Um, and in particular, given uh, the use of a lot of um, computer-assisted, uh, personalized learning techniques, is that going to set things um, at even a higher bar for students um, that have learning differences. And what this paper unpacks is that given the neurodiversity of each and every student, that if we apply UDL guidelines, Universal for Design guidelines, to the digital world, that not only do students with learning differences benefit, but in fact we see greater benefit for all students. So. Um, the final paper on this slide that you see um, looked at the question of um, what are we doing in mathematics for Latino and Latina students and black students. Um, and what this paper found is that while only um, really one dominant type of mathematics instruction is still privileged and common in our schools, um, how mathematics is 
understood and how it is taught is highly culturally uh, influenced across the world. So whether uh, so, what this paper uh, discovered is that if we start um, building in more of the techniques that have been uh, more successful in, say, out of school settings, um, more culturally relevant mathematics techniques, small group instruction, um, and that we have um, high correlation to students from traditionally marginalized groups showing improvement on mathematics outcomes. So this is just a sampling of places where we went really deep to say, do these different kinds of student-centered approaches, um, have they been shown to be effective with certain populations? And these reports were ones that we came out with several years ago. Um, these two covers you're seeing now are part of a series of research that we released just this past October where we did new research. Um, and in fact, we continued our interest in engaging students in mathematics um, with the Improvement Science PCC on the right, um, which is a whole community called the Mathematical Agency Improvement Community that really looked at um, trying to abolish the phrase I'm just not a math person. Uh, and what this study has done is it has developed um, some really user-friendly, immediately off-the-shelf teachers can use it kinds of protocols um, and ways of teaching mathematics that um, break down those conscious or unconscious barriers we have um, in ourselves about who is good at math and also who can do math, who is a good mathematician. Um, and that website you see there is one that we help sponsor them to develop um, in which you can see videos of what this looks like in the classroom and all sorts of different resources and tools. Um, on the left, you see a paper that we commissioned, uh, sorry, that we uh, supported AIR to do a study with called Exploring the Relationship Between Collaboration, Personalization, and Equity. And this one left aside some of those specific content areas I was just mentioning and really looked at um, two core aspects of student-centered learning, collaboration and personalized learning. And what it found is that while, um, in general, students in collaborative, personalized settings um, reported more engagement, and we know there is a very close um, a causal relationship between engagement and school outcomes. In particular, for um, black boys, there was um, clearly a uh, interaction effect between um, between collaboration and personalization itself. So that, in fact, when these two kinds of approaches were done in a high quality uh, transparent and interconnected way, black males did better than their counterparts who um, weren't exposed to these kinds of things. But when they were done um, in a way that didn't engage um, these black males and when they were done in isolation, so say one teacher was really heavily focused on collaboration but wasn't really personalizing it to the needs and interests of their students, um, we, didn't see the, the, we didn't see the whole results. So what each of these different things are pointing out is the fact that while absolutely these kinds of student-centered learning techniques are happening and are uh, value, valuable and have value add for many different kinds of populations, um, we need to really pay careful attention to how they're being done um, and the uh, intentionality around the implementation, which my colleague Ace Percy will speak to, I believe, a little bit next. Um, so I want to leave you with um, three different resources that have lots and lots more uh, recommendations and research on how policymakers can specifically uh, engage in some of this. The first is the Students at the Center Hub uh, website, which has not just things for policymakers on it, but um, well over a thousand curated free resources, um, research, frameworks, articles, um, that are curated by humans and added to on a, a regular basis, um, highly searchable, and also that's where you would find that map that I showed you and lots of other places where conversations uh, around social, um, sorry, on social media where conversations on student-centered learning are taking place. And in particular, if you add those search function at the end of the uh, URL that I have there, you will find resources that are targeted um, specifically for policymakers. 
Um, the second piece is a project that we completed and released this past fall, 10 Principles of High Quality Assessment. And this was um, both a research project but also uh, an advocacy piece in the sense that we worked uh, with not only the 22 national and expert signatories who um, came on with a, a signing um, uh, uh, signing privilege that said, you know, yes, this is something we have done in our work, believe in our work, and will continue to advocate for, but we also vetted it much more um, broadly. And what this does is it develops recommendations for what at both a state level and a district level should go into um, a full a balanced system of assessments that's going to um, both enable the kinds of student-centered approaches that we're finding are really effective and also um, help build a system that is more college career and community focused. So great um, resource in there that has some specific recommendations for policymakers. Um, and I should mention on the um, students at the Center Hub resource, each of the papers that I just talked about, as well as many more, has specific policy-oriented briefs and specific um, executive summaries that speak to policy outcomes. Um, and then the final piece that I have mentioned on there is uh, it's very clear that even the best intentioned school districts and states are not going to be able to move towards embracing more of these student-centered learning approaches in a high-quality way if we aren't deeply thinking about how to uh, involve and include and develop our educator workforce and the leaders in schools. So with CCSSO, the Council of Chief State School Officers, we developed a set of educator and leadership competencies that really maps out what an educator would need to be able to do and the kinds of practices and beliefs they would need and the kinds of support and training they need in order to be uh, effective in student-centered settings. And so each one of those also um, contains a lot of implications for how we think about um, policy and uh, supporting a transformational education system. So with that, uh, thank you. This is me, uh, another shot of me. It turns out I didn't match my pictures, but now you get multiple views. Um, and uh, <laughs> happy to answer questions, but as part of the chat, and now turning it over to Ace. <laughs> great. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. And I can vouch for all those resources. They're really, really great resources. And I will say that I think from the beginning that uh, Rebecca's presentation blew my mind in a new way because the, one of the only reasons I'm here is I'm not a math person. So <laughs> I'm, I think I'm after this webinar, I'm going to have to reevaluate everything <laughs> uh, about my life. Um, so thank you so much to NCSL for presenting this. I think it's such an important uh, conversation to have and specifically to think about it in terms of how we serve those most disadvantaged learners. Because at the end of the day, I don't think any of us are in this business to widen opportunity gaps. Um, and I recently moved from Washington, D.C. to West Virginia, so now I have actual legislators, um, which has been really great. And um, some friends who are in our legislature, and they will always, I think, come up with the first question of like, all right, how do we fund this? And I just want to put this slide in here because I think it raises the point that our budgets aren't isolated, that when we're not serving these students effectively, we pay for them somewhere else. So just like, I mean, when you look at this, half of our young adults with uh, learning disabilities and other health issues like the ADHD have been involved in the justice system in some way. Um, disciplinary removals, you look at two thirds of the removals in special education involve students with LD. So we're not, we're not effectively creating an education system that serves these students. We do end up paying for it. It just may not be out of the direct classroom expenditures or the education expenditures, but it definitely will show up somewhere else in the budget. Um, and I, w I put this slide in here in terms of just thinking about what type of learning uh, we want to ex we expect uh, for our students with disabilities, English learners, and these other populations. And um, while literacy and math are so fundamentally and will always remain fundamentally important, it's important to realize that we're not going to be sending our students with disabilities or English learners or any of these other populations to a separate planet. We're not, they're not going to need uh, these other skills. And so I'm not college and career ready enough to create this slide. The slide was created by the 
uh, Hewlett Foundation, and I just use it. Uh, but I think it really highlights the point that as you look, these the skills that were important in 1970 because of automation or whether it be because of uh, outsourcing of jobs, they're not the most they're not the highest uh, relevant skills today. And so, how do we create an education system that prepares our youth for the challenges that they're going to be entering today, not the ones that we were entering yesterday? Um, to that point, I think that there is a really um, great opportunity to use some of these strategies as real game changers in our education system. We did a deep dive in three states that re uh, reflected different uh, demographics and geographic diversity, and we're at different stages of implementation. Though, so those states were uh, New Hampshire, uh, Colorado, and North Carolina. And we, uh, we interviewed close to 100 uh, practitioners and policy leaders and disability advocates and researchers and ask them, when you think about these sorts of innovative strategies, what do you see as the unique opportunities for your kids with disabilities? And then we also ask them, what do you see as the unique opportunity challenges uh, for those same students? And what was really striking was that when people identified the opportunities, what they were really reflecting was like a matter of potential. So they would tell us, you know, these opportunities grant greater student voice and engagement, and our students with disabilities aren't often granted that voice. They're not, they're often given more rote experiences. That this is more of a strengths-based rather than a deficit-based approach to learning. That rather than waiting for it at the end and declaring a student a failure, we can provide more systemic targeted supports. Uh, we can provide multiple ways for students to access content rather than just one. And there's other that our students with disabilities often don't have access to some key skills that they need in the future, like self-advocacy. And then when we challenges, it would be like literally two sides of that same coin. So they would say, oh yeah, that engagement thing, our educators haven't really ever been prepared to effectively do that for our um, traditionally disadvantaged learners. That it can be strengths-based, but we have to deal with the history of the adult mindsets that would um, believe that students don't have these kinds of strengths and can't really succeed in that, in that environment, that we don't have the effective support system set up, or that the systems are not inherently built excessively, so we don't have those multiple ways to access content, and that um, at the same time that we're focusing on these skills and decisions, we can't see, take our eyes off the fact that some of our students are really, really struggling, and we need it to have an accountability and data system that highlights that. Um, so, I think that that all raises the issue of how do we think about equity and how do we think about our education initiatives more broadly and that in each of our states, this will mean something a little bit differently. The history of Colorado's experience when it comes to deal, working with these uh, students was different than North Carolina or New Hampshire's. And um, with all these, but within a broader national framework, we know that you know, there was a time in our nation's history and our state's histories where the very rights of individuals with disabilities, the right to exist in society was put in question. And so you, you don't have to look much further than if you wanna just take a moment and Google Teddy Roosevelt and disabilities and see like what came up in you know, letters that he would write. Um, and then we look at the rehabilitation lens where students, individuals are coming back from World War II, and we're trying to now rehabilitate individuals with disabilities, and that's the lens in our society. And then after that, and it was in the mid-70s where we started to think about inclusion and engaging all our students in the same sort of learning environments. Obviously, you know, like some of these things are no longer present, but they are part of our histories, and they are part of, they do inform how our adults and students uh, think about themselves and, uh, and each other in the system. So I, I would say that the, if I had one takeaway um, that I would want you to take, uh, take back with you, it's this, that every single uh, initiative and every single state that we've looked at um, has basically implemented these strategies and then they've gone back and appointed a task force or a subcommittee, and there's no shortage of those, to think about why aren't these strategies working for our individuals with disabilities or English learners or plug in your specific group. And the reality is that the, these students were not built into the system 
at the very fore of the initiative. They were retrofitted afterwards. So this is a, uh, a time that we really need to be um, proactive and thinking about how do we start rather than end with these uh, students. Um, we've done some work in terms of thinking about what are the specific practices and strategies that can be used to do that. Um, and so there are things that we know work in special education. One of those is around thinking about how do we promote self-advocacy and self-determination uh, for our students with disabilities. And it's really important for, to do that in K-12 because once our students leave K-12, they're often in higher education or employment or civic outcomes where they are put in a position where they have to advocate for their needs. But they've never had that experience to, to do that. So how do we make sure that things that are happening, whether they're IEP meetings or transition meetings or whatever those meetings are, we put students at the center and empower them to actually eventually facilitate those meetings so that they have uh, experiences advocating for their own needs. Powerful engaging instruction, how do we make sure that we're uh, building some of these skills and dispositions explicitly for populations? Uh, that if we know and we value these and we know that our employers and our post-secondary institutions um, are demanding them, what do we do when our students are falling behind? Do we have a comprehensive and intervention support system to be able to catch them? Uh, and is that intervention system built on some measures? Do we, are we measuring effectively some of these skills and dispositions so that we know that we're doing this well? And lastly, making sure that we're doing this in an inclusive, explicitly inclusive way and um, really reiterating these values of growth mindsets and all these other skills and dispositions that are so important for our student success. So our recommendations, I think, uh, um, build on that. This is really an incredible opportunity for each of you on, on this call and if you're tuning in on this uh, later, um, to get this right, make sure that the vision is inclusive at the very outset, to back that vision with resources, because God knows that if you don't put the resources here, you'll put the resources somewhere else, that eventually you'll be paying for this, um, to make sure that we are building in the specific competencies for our educators to implement that for all our learners. Um, to make sure that this is not something that we use and as an excuse to take a step backwards on accountability and holding ourselves to the highest standards for, um, for all our students because that's not going to do those students or our states any favors. Um, and to make sure that, you know, we, there's a lot of this that we don't know and that we need to pilot and test and we should be uh, forthright in that and what and as much as what we know as what we don't know and to look at this as a long game uh, continuous process and see what strategies are working for which students under which conditions and then to make sure that we're uh, communicating that effectively to our families of our students with disabilities because all these populations have been through the whole reform ringer in the past and they've been uh, not served effectively so we need to make sure that we engage them from the very outset. So that is uh, kind of my spiel. There will be a blog coming up at some point. And if you uh, wanted to look more into our resources, you just have to go to ncld.org slash personalized learning. And all these resources from the states or we have case studies, all these things will be uh, on there. But again, so grateful for all of you for tuning in. So grateful for NCSL for raising this uh, as an important conversation. I'll hand it over to Natalie now. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us here um, to share our passion for serving all students and student subgroups at high levels. And um, thank you to uh, Rebecca and ACE for expanding my understanding of serving diverse student needs and highlighting the urgency of equity and inclusion in our work. Um, so my part of the presentation is going to dig into a report that we did on how student-centered learning has been able to support a unique population of students, specifically English language learners. Um, uh, so just a brief introduction to INACO. We are a nonprofit dedicated to transforming education to student-centered learning. We're connected to educators and school districts leading innovation in education and implementing student-centered learning practices. Uh, in, our, in addition, our Center for Policy provides technical assistance and lawmaker education to state policymakers. 
So at the heart of our work is the belief that we need to reimagine a vision of a future focused education system that enables all students to learn and achieve at the highest levels. And in order to do that, we need to redefine student success and ask what are the knowledge, skills, and dispositions our students need to be successful in their futures towards college, career, and civic life, um, similar to the skills that Ace presented earlier. It's just asking policymakers and community leaders to come together and, and talk about what is what are the skills that you identify in your community and with your students as, as being important um, for the state, the community, and the contributions you want the students to um, be able to have and later in their life when they exit K-12 education. And from there, we need to redesign systems of assessments to align to student learning, develop educator capacity, and rethink how state accountability systems can drive continuous improvement throughout. And in order to do this, it's so important that policymakers um, support transformation at scale. Um, so to dig into the report, Next Generation Learning Models for English Language Learners, in 2017, we did a field research of over 50 schools across the United States, um, as well as with English language learner experts, and heard from educators and school leaders at the forefront of designing new models, personalized model, um, competency-based education models to better serve English language learner students. Um, and, and we just wanted to highlight like why this work was so important. Um, we realized that English language learners are the fastest growing student subgroup, um, yet almost 20% of them do not graduate on time. And about 40% of ELL students are placed in remediation classes after leaving the K-12 education system. Um, so clearly the, the current model, the one size fits all English remediation courses that a lot of our ELL students are caught into this, this cycle are not working and often require students to catch up in English within a specific amount of time, regardless of their entry point. And the entry point into English um, language is, is actually very key to understanding English learners. Um, so in our current traditional model, we are often placing our English learners in learning environments that are deficit-based, that don't fully see diverse student backgrounds and their primary language as an asset. And we know that learning is not one size fits all. The research from the science of learning and development support building on student prior knowledge and experiences. And for English learners, their language, their cultural identity, and their backgrounds make up their prior knowledge and learning experiences that just cannot be replaced by English instruction to reach reading and math proficiency. And um, frankly, we are doing our English learners a disservice if we are too narrowly focused on English only assessments and instruction and exit requirements rather than embedding students in relevant and rigorous learning approaches. Um, and the reason why we focus on next generation learning models was we, we understood that there was a need to provide English learners with personalized supports to meet them where they are. And we had heard from so many of, um, of our members in the field, of educators and uh, school leaders telling us that they are really trying to redesign and reimagine what English instruction could look like and how to make teaching culturally relevant um, within next generation learning models to serve English learners. Um, and it, it's so important to personalize learning for English learners because they are such a complex group of students um, coming into classrooms with very different entry points. Um, so next gen models hold the potential to reach them when learning is personalized, when they're able to advance based on demonstrated mastery, when they receive targeted supports to help them reach their learning goals. So what we did was um, we looked at our research on how English learners learn best and um, our knowledge of competency-based education system. And we put this table together to show how competency-based education can meet the learning needs of English learners. So the first column shows the five tenets of competency-based education. And the second column describes the kinds of environments that English learners need to succeed. Um, for example, they need integration of content standards and language development standards um, and tools to help them access content learning objectives. They need culturally responsive teaching. Um, they need uh, skilled educators who understand like 
even if they're not proficient in, in English, that their um, math skills may be quite high or that, um, you know, their proficiency in their language is, is in reading is, is very high and, you know, finding different access points and entry points to reach their, um, their learning development is, is really crucial. So having that kind of expertise is important. Um, and those are considerations that educators need to have and school leaders need to have when they're serving a population of English learners. And so the third column shows the integration of how competency-based education can serve and meet the learning needs of English learners. This table essentially highlights opportunities for English learners in um, student-centered learning environments and, and how we can embed, um, edit our, our standards or reinterpret them for English learners. So from our literature review on how English learners learn best, um, we came up with four core principles for next generation teaching and learning for English learners. The first is to redefine student success. Um, that has been said on this webinar, it's so important. We are seeing a move away from and beyond narrowly defining success for English learners as transitioning from students' primary language to proficiency in English. Students move towards mastery in both English and or dual language literacy and academic content in a lot of um, if schools that are serving English learners really well, as well as embedding important skills and dispositions needed to ensure success in college and careers. The second core principle is um, assessments of and for learning. It's important to measure student performance, not in comparison to non-EL students or native learners, but against articulated high expectations of success and clear depictions of what success looks like for English learners and a strong focus on formative assessments along with summative assessments that can offer more of a balanced look to provide educators with English learner student data on where these students are in their learning and inform next steps on um, their progress towards mastery. The third core concept is personalizing approach that approaches that focus on educating the whole child providing students um, with comprehensive supports and services that are focused on the whole child um, that would take into account English learners' backgrounds, cultures, prior learning experiences and preferences, um, among other considerations in order to reach and provide learning progressions and really provide a plan for um, helping each English learner meet their goals and, and their potential. And finally, building educator role and capacity um, there, there is a need to focus on best practices and personalized learning approaches and culturally responsive teaching for English learners. And finally, just some emerging themes that we saw from the field um, when we were interviewing and talking and, and, and watching um, students learn in these kind of environments. Um, we saw some early trends in designing programs that can serve English le learners well in personalized and competency-based education. First is when educators are creating a culture and climate dedicated to continuous improvement um, that take into consideration e um, English learners' backgrounds and their assets. So we know that transitioning to a competency-based education system can take years and so and continuously improving the design and implementation of the system is really important. Many education programs are relatively new still to incorporating the specific needs of English learners. Um, so it's important to acquire the feedback of educators, students, and parents on what works and to cultivate a culture of growth mindset to improve the design services that work for English learners. The second emerging theme we saw was um, the need to examine, update, and build educator capacity and professional development. So teaching in a personalized competency-based student-centered learning system with effective pedagogical approaches for English learners requires a development of new skills among teachers and school leaders. So beginning with teaching as inquiry, focusing on research and evidence-based practices, and having a collaborative community of practice to share strategies and methods across the school are important ways to build educator capacity and provide op um, embedded opportunities for professional development specific to the need of English learners. And finally, designing new ways to meet English learners where they are. 
Um, and, and I think that's where the field may be struggling a little bit is to truly gauge where English students are, English learner students are in their learning and moving these students forward. This is typically much easier said than done. It involves smartly and accurately assessing English learners and their languages, um, having great translation services, assessment services, um, understanding English learners' entry points into English and academic content and providing the appropriate scaffolds along the way to help English learners access their learning materials to meet their goals. So we need specialized educators. We need educators that any educator that um, teach English learners or a special population to have um, a special skill set or to have professional development where they can learn expanded skills and culturally relevant ways to reach their English learners. We also know that in order to personalize learning, um, there is a need and, um, well, not really a need, but there, there's an opportunity to use a lot of the technology, emerging technology out there to reach um, our students to, you know, to understand like different curriculum and content that um, are more culturally relevant if the school cannot provide it. So there are so many of these opportunities out there and um, the field is, is, is bursting with them and, and we invite you all to learn more, to share the work that you're advancing and to engage with us um, at our symposium in Palm Springs this fall. In previous year, we've had schools serving English learners from across the U.S. Um, representing different learning systems and income levels that are implementing personalized competency education for these diverse students. And there's just a lot to learn from the field and we invite you to come and engage with us. Um, and these are some of our resources that you can find online. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a really rich discussion and in some really important ideas for policymakers to keep in mind as they keep moving toward this vision of student-centered learning. Thank you again so much to Rebecca Wolf, Ace Parsi, and Natalie Trong for joining us today. This was a fantastic discussion. We really greatly appreciate your insights. And if there are folks um, who would like to be connected with any of these experts, reach out to me and we will make that happen. Um, as a reminder to our participants, this webinar and PowerPoint will be available to watch on the NCSL website in a few days, so you can share it with your interested colleagues. And I do encourage you to stay tuned to the NCSL website for information about upcoming webinars in our series for the NCSL Student-Centered Learning Commission. I want to thank again the Nellie May Education Foundation and our sponsoring group, the NCSL Student Centered Learning Commission, and thanks to all of you out there for joining us today. We encourage you to stay connected and get in touch if we can be of assistance. Have a great rest of your day. The webinar is now concluded.